All right. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Thane Kreiner, CEO of Marin Agricultural Land Trust, MALT. I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, here at MALT, we wish to acknowledge that our work and conservation easements happen on the unceded ancestral lands of the Coast Miwok people of present day Marin and Southern Sonoma counties. This is land that continues to be of great importance to Coast Miwok peoples. We as an organization seek to move ourselves to work with and for the Coast Miwok and other indigenous peoples, celebrating and learning from their land stewardship of this area for tens of thousands of years. We want to honor with gratitude the land itself and all of its ancestors, past, present, and emerging. Welcome to our Common Ground. Our Common Ground is a series of conversations uh, to explore issues related to the future of agriculture and food. And our goal is really to surface solutions to some of the world's most pressing problems. And in the process, unite farmers, ranchers, environmentalists, conservationists, and other community members in imagining a future of sufficient and nourishing food for everyone produced in ways that are healthy um, and, uh, and promote a diverse natural environment and provide everyone in the food value chain a dignified livelihood. Our topic today is food justice. And if you Google food justice, you'll see a lot of different definitions of the term, and we'll get to that in just a moment, connected to issues of land access, agricultural practices, environmental, social, and racial justice. Uh, but I really want to dive in right now with the panelist introductions, and then we'll unpack the meaning of food justice a little bit. So if we could start with you, uh, Chandra Alexandra from Community Action Marin. Chandra. Good afternoon, Thane. Thank you for having me and delighted to be with everyone this afternoon. My name is Chandra Alexander. I am the Chief Executive Officer of Community Action Marin. We are Marin County's largest nonprofit social services agency. And if you don't know where Marin County is, we're just across the Golden Gate Bridge from San Francisco. We have an incredible richness of opportunity in Marin County, and I'm excited to talk a little bit more deeply about what that means given the issues of racial and economic injustice and the quest for justice in the county and beyond with a centering on food. And I'm happy to say that part of what we offer as a social services agency is a deep connection to trusted relationships and relationships with land and food as part of that. So thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, Chandra. We have Matt Wilson with us. Uh, closely related to food justice is food sovereignty. Uh, Matt is the food sovereignty director at Chichangu Corp uh, Community Development Corporation. Matt, thank you for joining us. Hi, everybody. My name is Matt Wilson. Um, I'm just going to introduce myself in my um, native language. So, how Epi, Matthew Wilson, Machaplo, Chante Washte, Na Pecho I'll give a quick brief um, kind of what we do. Um, so we are um, a non nonprofit located on the homelands of the Rosa Sioux tribe. Um, traditionally, Sichangu Lakota is what we call ourselves. Um, and, and then I think for us, uh, uh, food justice starts with the, kind of the understanding of how we got here, um, followed by, you know, investments of time and money. Um, and, and if you look at uh, the kind of the history of the land and where food comes from, um, I think that's kind of where you kind of start at. Um, acting in a way that we're going to repair is the, kind of the harm that was done. Um, and so for us, we are focused on the core areas of health, education, housing, and food sovereignty. Thanks, Matt. Really grateful to you uh, for, for being here with us. Uh, Lindsay Allen, uh, producer of an uh, uh, upcoming series, uh, short series of films, uh, Point of Origin. Lindsay. Hi, uh, thank you, Thane, for having me. And thanks to everyone who's tuning in. As Thane mentioned, I am the creative producer and host of Point of Origin, which is a docu-series in development focused on tracing the world's most compelling supply chains back to the human stories and the communities that keep them thriving. A little bit about me, my background is not in film and TV at all. I actually worked in international development and agricultural development for several years, mostly across the African continent and a little bit in Europe as well. I was working across value chains like cocoa and maize in the middle, working with farmers on the ground and also working with supply chain sustainability executives, really seeing firsthand that um, we, even supply chain sustainability executives lack a visualization of the realities of growing food. And I wanted to create a space for not only them to get that visualization, but 
the average person, because I believe when we have that and when we know more about how globalized our food has become, it gives us the power to do more about it and create the future, the food future that we want to see. Yeah. Um, thanks for underscoring the importance of, of local food. And we'll dive into that a little bit more when we talk about food justice and food uh, sovereignty. Uh, Mark Goodman, chairman of Colorado Nut Company, and also uh, on the program advisory council for the Black Corporate Board uh, program. Mark. Well, good afternoon. And uh, Thane, again, thank you for uh, the gracious invitation to um, be a part of this important conversation in so many ways. Uh, as uh, Thane indicated, I'm chairman and CEO of the Colorado Nut Company. Uh, we're just under a 60-year-old Colorado company and a high-quality producer of nuts, trail mix, snacks, and confection items that we ship out broadly across the U.S. and selectively across uh, North America. Uh, in addition to that, as Thane indicated, I'm a proud uh, founding member and thought partner with Thane and other colleagues on the important work at the University of Santa Clara uh, called the Black Corporate uh, Board Director Initiative uh, to uh, simply uh, identify help and uh, encourage a higher concentration of uh, Blacks on corporate boards, uh, work that's uh, near and dear to my heart. Uh, so great to be with everybody uh, this afternoon. Thanks, Mark. Um, thanks again to all of our uh, panelists for joining us. And for our guests, um, feel free to uh, type uh, questions into the Q&A or the chat, whichever is most comfortable for you. Um, we'll address them uh, as they come up, uh, perhaps, but we'll also plan to leave some time at the end of our conversation uh, over the next um, uh, 40 minutes or so, 45 minutes, uh, to directly address any questions. So just want to leave that chat open for you to raise comments. Uh, celebrate the things that uh, our different panelists are saying. Uh, but let's dive in now and really talk about what does food justice mean to you and how does it inform your work? And maybe we can uh, start with you, Mark, and talk about um, the dynamics of, of access and how food justice relates to that. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, you know, from my standpoint and in just under uh, 30 years of uh, working in all things share a stomach, I can tell you that when I think about food justice, implicit right away is, is really uh, the lack thereof or injustice, and specifically injustice, uh, Thane did the word you just used, which is to me <clears throat> among the most important, and it's, it's lack of equitable access, lack of equitable access in terms of in many communities, uh, urban to rural, and particularly urban in terms of equitable access to simply have uh, good quality ability to have food purchased for at-home consumption. Also, uh, it applies to lack of good quality uh, choices in terms of food away from home, uh, in terms of equitable access. And, and when I combine those things in terms of, of our current U.S. landscape, and even thin slicing it across our 25 biggest metropolitan markets that really comprise 82% of our touches 82% of our population. That's where we see it most stark. From my hometown area of Detroit, Michigan, where in inner city Detroit, it's easier to get to a liquor store than it is to a grocery store. Uh, same thing in aspects of Cleveland, Atlanta, uh, Los Angeles, uh, and other cities, certainly. Uh, I also think about it, Thane, at, at a macro level in terms of, I call it the math that is maddening to me. Uh, each year in this country, we waste about 110 billion pounds of food. Uh, that much food, were we to change our behavior and things, would be more than enough uh, to feed everybody in this country without having issues. 40% uh, of the food uh, that we produce in America ends up being wasted, which again is in that category of maddening math for me. And the last data point that I'll share is basically it comes down to about a pound of food per person per day is wasted in the United States of America. And, and again, I've not, I've not included westernized world. I've not included Canada to South America or, or Europe. I'm just using specifically right here, the United States of America. So when I think about those things combined qualitatively and quantitatively, uh, it paints a picture of why we are having this important conversation from my perspective around food justice 
and injustice uh, based in part macro trends, macro behavior, but where it disproportionately harms uh, the least of the in our country in terms of particularly black and brown populations. Some of that does include rural whites in terms of being factual, but disproportionately uh, black and brown populations in our urban settings. So uh, those are a few of the things that, I, that come to mind, uh, Thane, when I think about that important question. Thanks very much, Mark. So Marin Agricultural Land Trust works in, in Marin County to pr preserve uh, agricultural land for agricultural use. And uh, as a consequence of, of Malt's work, uh, we have protected over half of the vulnerable farmland in Marin County. Um, and there's a lot of really great work um, going on with climate beneficial practices uh, by the ranchers and the farmers. And in the Bay Area food shed, a lot of people have uh, the privilege of being able to choose um, what they eat. And I think with that privilege, there's a, a corollary responsibility to um, choose food that you know where it came from, how it was produced, and how people in the, the uh, food value chain were, were treated. But even here in Marin County, everyone doesn't have access um, to uh, sufficient food. And uh, I'd really love to hear from you, uh, Chandra, um, about the work of Community Action Marin and how you think about um, food justice and, and the access issues that, that Mark was talking about on a national basis. How do they impact us here, right here in Marin County? Yeah, thanks, Thane. And Mark, absolutely underscoring so many of the good points that you make. Uh, in Marin County, we have incredible inequities and whether that's rural populations versus urban populations versus um, the sort of food apartheid of access to uh, local organic, fresh food for people. Um, it's been a glaring challenge to just meet basic food security needs, even in as affluent a county as Marin is. And nationally, Marin typically ranks in the top five of most affluent counties. And even with that, and in particular through the last 18 to 20 months, we have really seen the number of people who are having to make incredibly painful, difficult choices between paying rent or putting food on the table increase. And as a key provider of a safety net series of supports in the county, we have needed to partner stronger and better across the county to ensure that people did have access to food. Uh, one of the ways that we've seen um, I think grow in importance is the ability of individuals to have connection to land, to have connection to access food that they are growing themselves, that they can know they have a ready way of being in relationship with land and food and people to ensure that they and their families uh, across generations are fed. So with the inequities, we've seen this rise in the challenges of basic food security, which then raises the question of, well, for us today, what does food justice mean? And I think in Marin County, you cannot separate the issues of people having good, healthy food and food justice as good food for all from the true racial and economic inequities that we see reflected here. Because as you've well pointed out, in our community too, and we serving communities of low income, those communities of low income are by and large people of color. And so the challenges that we're seeking to address through the food justice focus that we have as an agency is ensuring that we can feed people. And that does mean partnering with the food bank, that does mean partnering with other emergency support systems. But it also has meant for us quite literally breaking ground on a farm for us in the center of San Rafael and breaking new ground on a farm now in Novato in Northern Marin to make sure that our people who are being served, our children and families through our childcare early education programs are connecting to land. We're putting back into through our commercial kitchen, the food that those families are growing. We're seeing smiles and learning happen in those uh, outdoor classrooms as opportunities for stronger connection across um, differences and bringing people together. And whether that's volunteer days or farming days or um, just food focused days for community to gather, we're seeing incredible, um, I want to say, sort of vitality around this idea of food returning to central importance as a meaningful human experience. So the strength of food then becomes, and we think about going into the holidays, breaking bread with one another as a sort of metaphor for this larger 
push toward equity that is so important as we as human beings think about what does it mean to be part of society and food becomes i think the literal and symbolic um, way for us to move that conversation forward. Food is also a connector in ways that help create access for people who do have access to food to find a way into often challenging conversations. So what I'm happy about is being able to provide increased literal food security, but also giving people that chance to connect in our farm, in the gardens, in the work of, of feeding families, feeding people in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Chandra. Um, that's really a great setup for us to, to hear from, from Matt about the perspective um, from indigenous peoples who have, have been forced off uh, a lot of their lands uh, in, the, in this country. And, and how do you think about, Matt, about uh, what's your perspective on food justice and how do you approach it in terms of, of food sovereignty and the sovereignty of, of peoples? Yeah, I think for us as uh, Lakota people, um, food justice means looking at, you know, what happened to, to the buffalo. Um, you know, our, our food system here was based around buffalo, you know, so was our economy. Um, and buffalo was systemically wiped out by, you know, settlers in the U.S. government. Um, and so that disruption to our way of life, you know, persists to this day. Um, and, and so if you look at bison or buffalo reliant nations, um, they have an average income that's you know, half of that of other native nations that are focused around you know, fishing or other areas. Um, and so you can't talk about food justice without talking about indigenous people. Um, and we must have a seat at the table when creating these solutions. Um, and then to, uh, for us, I, I think food justice starts with um, the basic understanding of how, how we got here to this current food system. Um, followed by investments and in, in time and in, in, in money. Um, and then for us, the way we do that here is we are focusing around food sovereignty. And food sovereignty and food justice are two concepts that have you know, similar aims and strategies. Um, but for indigenous communities especially, we tend to use the term food sovereignty, um, just because it has this more of a connotation of being um, independent and self-sustaining, you know, uh, um, and which is something that Native nations strive to be. Um, I think it's just also a nod to, you know, the political status of uh, Native nations, our, our, our tribes, what people know, um, as, as sovereign governments with their own, you know, power and legislation and um, jurisdiction, um, especially around land. Great. Thank you, Matt. Lindsay, you've been traveling around um, talking to different food producer communities. Can you um, talk about food justice from the perspective? How is the system how is the system working and what are you learning? What are you seeing in terms of your views on food justice? Yeah, well, you know, everyone has had such pointed answers so far. And I remember when we have this conversation and when I hear these responses, I think of a quote that circulates around conversations about food systems quite often, which is that our food system is working exactly how it was designed to work. And that is to exclude and to marginalize and to be unequal. And so when I think of food justice, I think of system revolution. And I know that is a phrase that scares a lot of people and sometimes puts people on the defense. But, you know, it's a phrase that I think we need to learn how to be more comfortable with when we talk about food justice, because if we are going to create more opportunity for folks at all at both ends of the supply chain, then it requires, you know, these measures of systems redesign. You know, I'm uh, Mark spoke about how he's from Detroit. I'm from Chicago. And uh, I had a very, you know, very, saw very similar things growing up and also just saw, you know, now having worked with producers and worked on farms and, you know, worked with farmers and talked to farmers, all I, you know, I would make this joke, oh, I'm such a city girl or from the city. And I think it just goes to show we, you know, pe folks in cities are so disconnected from our foodways and we just don't get exposure to that unless you grow up in a very agrarian community. And, you know, with our food ways being so globalized as they are now, it creates this, you know, manner in which our lives are way more global than we realize. And that is really what drives, you know, our work, our team's work at Point of Origin is this idea that knowledge is power. And in order to kind of reorient the way that we think about systems revolution and systems redesign and understanding where our food comes from and who are the people at the starting point, 
then we need a segue and we need an access point into that and to have those conversations with growers. And, you know, sometimes it's not always pretty. Sometimes we have to have very candid, very tough conversations. But I think that is the way to build those bridges. So let's sort of pick up there, Lindsay, and talk a little bit more about the notion of, of community around um, food justice. And, and you know, one of the, one of the things I, I recall you talking about was uh, being um, at, a, at a COCO conference in, in Berlin. And I think it's a great example of, of um, what you just talked about, how the food systems are designed and, and how they're actually working. Um, so would you mind um, sharing that story a little bit? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I, I think it speaks to the fact when we talk about community and food, it is very much oriented around planes of power. And I noticed that when I was working in, um, in Ghana, we were, I was working with a team that was creating tech solutions for cocoa farmers at the beginning of the supply chain. And then we were also building customized solutions for corporations, chocolate brands and traders at the other end of the supply chain. And, um, you know, one year I attended the World Cocoa Conference in Berlin, which, first of all, why is the World Cocoa Conference in Berlin when most of the world's cocoa is grown in West Africa and Latin America? So that was the first question. But the conference was um, mostly comprised of 3,000 attendees, mostly people who work in supply chain sustainability and people like myself trying to sell things to people who work in supply chain sustainability. And one of the keynote speakers um, was one of the brothers who still owns the Mars bar company, Mars. And he asked a really pointed question. He asked how many people in this room have been to a cocoa farm in the last year? And I think about 25 to 50 people raised their hands. And you know, I'm no math whiz, but 25 to 50 out of 3000 and most of those people were the token farmers they trot out from Cote d'Ivoire and Peru. So this is just showing you how you know disconnected even at the level of sustainability and of these conversations that we have become from where our food is grown. And, you know, I think that goes to show that we really need to change the way that we approach it. And, you know, when we talk about inclusion, we need to talk about the realities on the ground and make sure those are first and foremost. And the, the people who are having these experiences are included in the conversation. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, so, Chandra and Matt, not necessarily in that order, but, but one of the things that I admire about both of your work is that connecting people back to um, their, their foods. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit about how um, in Community Action Marin and the community gardens and, and work that you've done, Chandra, how you're, you're centering foods that might not be the ones that people find on, on grocery, grocery uh, store shelves. And then very similarly, Matt, um, uh, understanding a little bit more about, about food sovereignty and, and what it means, um, not just from what we eat perspective, but, but what we believe in, and who we are and, and our cultural systems. Chandra? Thank you. A lot of the community that we serve here at Community Action Marin are from Central and Latin America. And so when we broke ground on our farm in 2019, we really thought about and knowing that that food was going to go to the families that we serve and in particular the children, the younger preschoolers who are in our early childhood programs, is going to back into their menu. So we wanted to think about culturally responsive foods, foods that they and their families may have grown up with, or maybe their families uh, members who are farmers in um, Guatemala, for example, would be normally eating but didn't have access to here in Marin readily, or it was too expensive, frankly, because of all the uh, increased fees and whatnot. And they could only find it in a supermarket that wasn't readily convenient for them. So we decided to grow those foods and make the menus um, really reflective of the diversity of the community that we were serving. And it's been beautiful because the, the parents will come in and see the menus and see the children eating the foods and talk about the foods that they're eating. And so there is a heart connection that's rekindled to home and land and food and place and um, the connections that we have as people with one another. And it, it has brought such beauty into, you can think about a program and serving food, you know, a USDA approved meal, but then you bring in this element of, well, what is that food really and how it connects to culture? And it's a beautiful, beautiful way to strengthen the idea of food justice in community. Thanks, Chandra. Matt, do you want to pick up there, sir? Yeah. And so something that we do here is we're trying to change people's perspective around food. Um, from one being food as just a means of, you know, filling your, your stomach, um, phys your physical hunger, um, 
but changing the perspective that food is medicine, um, that has a holistic approach and, and you know, feeding you emotionally, spiritually. Um, and I, I think for us, uh, a lot of that has to do with um, coming from that food system that was, um, you know, eating with, with the seasons, hyperlocal, um, understanding the wild plants that grew here. And again, um, relying on the buffalo as one of our main protein sources. Um, then jumping to one that's, you know, a, a, a diet that's really, you know, full of processed foods. And, um, and, and so we, uh, right now we are trying to um, rebuild that connection with, with food and with the land. Um, so with that is incorporating more in traditional indigenous food knowledge from our elders, um, making sure that that knowledge um, is passed down to the next generation um, so that we can, um, you know, heal some of that intergenerational trauma. Um, and we're using food as kind of that, that um, the kind of the key or the, the drive to do that. Thanks, Matt. Mark, I wonder if you might want to jump in and talk a little bit. You've had some very interesting experiences over your vocation with, with food. Um, and and um, as, as from a recent conversation, I understand you're moving towards this, this concept of how to center um, on the center shelf, so to speak, foods that are, are better for people. Can you talk a little bit and sort of reverberating with what Lindsay talked about in terms of how the systems are designed and, and the, re, uh, the need, I mean, picking up Lindsay's word to um, revolutionize or really transform them so that everybody has access to sufficient and nourishing food? Certainly, I, I think, you know, one of the points that Lindsay made uh, in terms of how the system is designed and it's designed to do just what it is doing is uh, is spot on, and when you when you layer that with the amount of food that is wasted uh, each year, what what happens is we 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 create this self fulfilling cycle of food prices continuing to go up, access becomes harder and harder, as uh, Chandra mentioned in, in some of her comments as well, because well when prices go up. And people either, if they are uh, underemployed, not employed, challenged with a, a home circumstance, uh, healthcare issues, childcare issues, all combinations of, of those things. Uh, and, uh, and of course, all of the things that Matt mentioned as it relates to uh, the ability to uh, be a part of what happens in generational pass down of of things that have been disrupted. So if people have a dependency on processed foods uh, thing that I know a thing or two about, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, um, uh, that creates, a, that creates a, a hard cycle to break. So I think for me, there, there are two things there that really are important in this conversation. One is how we think about, and, and uh, Lindsay mentioned revolution, and I think it's an appropriate term because in order to fix these things, we have to disrupt them. Because they won't just they won't just kind of incrementally work themselves out. You you won't all of a sudden have the food industry go. Oh well, we're gonna change our ways so that we don't increase prices, and um, you know we'll put a dent in the 110 billion pounds of food that gets wasted in in the U.S. That will take different thinking, a different way of approaching this. That I think in some aspects may be revolutionary, disruptive, but but needed because. Our system is are changing. They're continuing to perpetuate themselves, which is why I think uh, what Lindsay mentioned was so poignant because it, it's doing what it's designed to do. Um, by analogy, we, we kind of see this push and pull right now with fossil fuels, the traditional engine, a gas powered engine versus electric cars. And it's been a push and pull, but we, we see it in that space where the electric car companies now are coming about and the most valuable ones on the planet don't happen to be from the most traditional uh, gasoline powered, uh, if you will, car companies, GM, Chrysler, Ford, uh, again, from my hometown of Detroit, Detroit, Michigan, because they, they, they are not um, able to make the turn as quickly until others come along. And I, I call it disrupt, change the bar in the system. So if, if there was a way both uh, with what you're doing at malt, Thane and, and everybody on this panel and everybody a part of this uh, for us to, you know, have a version of Tesla in food, meaning that it, it, it disrupts, it tries to make it better, better access, 
uh, better health touch points across the board from access uh, from food away from home to food at home. Uh, I think we can we can make a, this problem a lot better, a lot quicker, but it will it will take, I think, disruptive thinking. Thanks, Mark. And, you know, if we have time today and, and you're, you're comfortable, I think it would be wonderful to hear some of your perspectives on, on systems uh, that, that you worked in before and, and what led you to um, what motivated you to help be a force for changing and disrupting them um, when we think about the, the, the large scale systems. And your comments were actually a, a great pivot to, to one of the questions we have in, in the chat here. Um, so, um, how can we change food inequality and, and what can Marin County folks do to help out? So the malt, as I said, has been protecting agricultural land since 1980. We were the first agricultural land trust in the United States. And um, from one perspective, we're the, the largest property rights owner in Marin County with, with easements on over 54,000 acres. Um, we have an ongoing obligation to help the people who are working on that land steward it. And I think that um, need for stewardship is more pronounced in a time of, of climate change with the fires we've had here over the last uh, several years, uh, the drought, which hopefully we're coming out of, but, but we don't know yet, a worse drought in at least 100 years. Um, and, and those kinds of climate impacts tend to um, uh, uh, have the, the deepest uh, and most profound negative uh, consequences on the people who can least, uh, least afford it. So when we think about what can Marin County folks do to uh, help out, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that in just a second, Chandra. But I think from the malt perspective, one of the questions that we're asking is exactly that, is um, if we're imagining a thriving and inclusive agricultural community in a healthy and diverse natural environment, which is our vision statement, what is our role in a addressing food inequality, food security, and, and food justice. So um, Chandra, I would love to hear your thoughts about Marin County. And then I think other panelists, the broader question, how can we, how can we change food inequality? It's a really great question. Chandra? Yeah, it's a great question. I have a few thoughts that come to mind. I think one is to address the fear around public benefits and people receiving public benefits because they're is still a lot of fear about getting the government assistance that people might be entitled to. And so when we think about and we see people who are able to access public benefits and are doing so, the stress and pressure and anxiety that's relieved from them in their day-to-day -day lives is tremendous. And we want to help ensure that people are relying on trusted local community-based organizations to get the access to CalFresh, to, to, to SNAP, to whatever the food support is that the government is offering and know that that's okay and that's something that they can do. Um, another in terms of what people can do, so that's sort of a communication education, help to support community and that education and outreach um, and increase the knowledge of trusted messengers in the, in the community to help ensure people have access to public benefits. Another is really to volunteer, to help support the organizations that are helping the food system. And there are many ways and, and many ways that organizations need support, um, whether that's around extra food or food pantries, or there are so many different ways that uh, nonprofit organizations and community partners are working to help alleviate food challenges locally. And I would say volunteer and get to know what those organizations need and sign up. There's always a need. I think the final one is really advocacy around the um, potentials for increasing uh, local uh, apportionments or allotments for um, public assistance so that there is the increased access to food at farmer mar farmers markets, for example, and really supporting those farmers markets and the local growers and helping to ensure that the local government is supporting any kind of federal or state efforts to ensure that people have access to the food that they need. So I know that's something that really um, was heightened out of the pandemic with the increased availability, but we really want to make sure that the county and local government is continuing to support that. So advocacy for shifts in public policy and appropriations at the local level to ensure that food security would be really appreciated. Matt, would you like to jump in there? And, and there's a related question uh, about uh, food justice and the idea of food deserts. And um, maybe you can even tell us what's behind you in the picture and, and how you're addressing um, the, uh, that food access with, with uh, healthy and nutritious foods. Yeah, um, so my background is a uh, picture of our farm, actually. Um, so behind my head, I don't know if you can see it, but it's our geodesic greenhouse. 
Um, so we have our, our farm that we, you know, grow food for the community. Um, you know, we manage a farmer's market, a mobile market. Um, this year we started the CSA program. Um, and, and so for us, I, I think the way people can, you know, help this movement is um, I think doing like one of one three things. Um, you can either, you know, learn. And for that is basically asking um, simple questions like where your, is your food coming from? Um, is it being grown using your gender practices? Um, who's profiting off of it? Um, is anybody being harmed by, you know, by this industry? Um, another one I like to really point out too is amplifying. Um, I, I think supporting or spreading the, the message or the story about other food leaders um, doing food justice work. Um, so I think so oftentimes um, these people who are doing this work are, are busy doing the actual work and, and don't really get a lot of time to share their own story. Um, and I think what um, Chandra said about you know acting, I think a lot of it is just, um, could be anything in terms of like changing your buying habits. Um, you know, I think supporting locally is going to be probably one of the best things you can do. Um, and even more so if you have access to it, you know, taking it upon yourself to, um, you know, grow your own food. I, I think having that extra step of um, having that connection of, with food in terms of like cooking with it, but also being able to see it grow and be a part of that process is, is very powerful. Lindsay, um, one of the things that came up in both Chandra and, and Matt's uh, uh, comments was uh, this notion of the, the stories of where food comes from. And that's really one of the driving forces behind your work with Point of Origin. Uh, would you like to maybe share one of those stories and help us understand what's, what's happening um, if we take a line of sight all the way back to the source of food that we find on a grocery, grocery uh, store shelf? Yeah, well, you know, first of all, just to speak to the food desert question real quick. I, you know, I live in Long Beach, California, which is a food desert in spite of the fact that we're home to the port of Los Angeles and Long Beach, those two ports, excuse me, um, which are one of two of the largest, if not the largest ports in this country. So all of this food, all of these goods are coming through the city, which is still a food desert. So if that doesn't show you kind of these planes of inequality and power, I don't know what it is. What is it? You know, I think they both Chandra and Matt spoke so poignantly to the fact that, um, you know, not only do we need to take these steps to create localized supply chains, but also it, the work doesn't stop there. So you could do all of those steps, but it just not, it's not like, okay, we're done now. We've done what we're supposed to do. It's, it's a long-term haul, you know? And part of that is having these conversations and having tough conversations with the people around you to raise awareness because I think all of the people who are attending this event, you're ahead of the curve. There's a lot of people you need to bring with you. And if you are working in food, if you are in the food space, creating space for black, brown and indigenous people of color to also become food leaders in this space so that they can do right by their communities. Um, you know, and going, yes, going back to the source, having those conversations, you know, the interesting thing and, you know, the thing that I love about the work that we're doing right now, our pilot, what we're working on is, you know, almonds in California. And those stories are gonna be very different from cocoa growers in Ghana, right? Or coffee growers in Vietnam or pineapple growers in Costa Rica or lobster men and lobster women in lobster people in Maine. So, you know, I think that is the core of why those conversations are so important because that experience differs so much, you know, whether it comes down to fair pay whether it comes down to sustainability issues, whether it comes down to a lot of the issues we talk about on a global scale that intersect with our food ways, right? Migration, urbanization, climate change. So, you know, these are all really linked to our food. And I think when you talk about the communities who are producing food on a mass scale to meet our demand, even though that demand and that access to that is unequal, you really learn how powerful food has become in our lives and we're just not aware. So I think that is the core of that conversation, understanding the differences across commodities and the, the lived realities of those who are growing food at a mass scale. Thanks, Lindsay. I, I love the list of um, the um, different growers, the almond growers, the lobster, uh, et cetera. And I'd add to that, you know, dairy ranchers in Marin County and, and the stories of how they produce um, this really incredible organic um, and often artisan food for the, for the Bay Area food shed. And at the same time, realizing, you know, coming back to comments that Chandra made earlier, that everybody doesn't have access to that. So, um, you know, a question in the chat here from uh, Aaron. Hey, Aaron, um, is um, what role 
role um, do local municipalities play in in each of your work? And and um, and what you know, I think a sort of broader framing of that question is. Um, what what would you like to see from them, as Aaron asked? But also, what are the capital stacks that we need to activate to to shift um, the, these um, food systems to ones that are are more sustainable uh, and more just? Anyone want to dive in on that? Mark, you're leaning forward, or Chandra? <clears throat> well, I, it, to, at least one, two things that come to mind on, on I mean, that multifaceted important question. One is um, I, pu public policy uh, and us leaning in and changing aspects of pol public policy is very important here um, because many of your large food companies, even regional based ones, um, when you actually lift up the, the, the tent, so to speak, they, they actually push back against local uh, farmers markets. They push back against farm to table in terms of consumers getting direct access from growers to the table. Because again, this plays directly into the, it, it disrupts part of or threatens part of the economics because they want consumers to go to a grocery store and purchase the food. And, that, and when you do that, <clears throat> there's so much built into costs, profitability, you know, the middle man, middle woman, middle person, uh, getting a, a, a piece of the, <laughs> action across all those things when it doesn't actually necessarily have to be that way across all fronts, uh, number one. And I think there, there's another aspect to it, it here that it is important, particularly from uh, those of us who are, you know, in, in governance roles, educators. And uh, it's something that uh, Chandra mentioned earlier, and that is, you know, the, the stigma around, from a standpoint of public policy around public access. Well, when you actually step back and shine the light on it and do do justice to public access, many of your largest companies, including food companies, benefit from public access. They get public access to taxpayer dollars uh, from the treasury. They get public access to um, you know, the largest amounts of PPP funding when we were going through that first part of the COVID crisis went to two thirds of that went to publicly traded companies. So um, that term public access oftentimes is allowed to be uh, used to, I think, uh, abuse, if not almost psychologically terrorize those that need it. But be clear, everybody up and down the chain, including some of the biggest companies, benefit from public access. So I just think it's important to also help to level set the conversation because that, that then starts to put a spotlight on where public policy works for some, but not a disproportionate many in other parts of, of the scale. Thanks, Mark. Chandra, did you want to jump in there? Yeah, I do. I want to create a little bit of a bright spot around possibilities for partnerships locally that can have us look at the origins of our food and really help to support changes in our system. Um, and that is the way that we got access to land was by looking at the land that we occupied and had been on for over 30 years in partnership with a local school district. And we had been supporting early childhood education and we saw shipping containers over there by that fence. And we turned to the school district and we said, hey, we want to start growing our own food. Would you give us access to this as part of absolutely. So we entered into a partnership with the school district. We were able to transform that land and break ground and bring community together and um, teachers and parents and celebrate really the creation of something in community with community for community by community. And that was a powerful move. So ultimately what we'd like to do, and I know some, some partners are doing this, is bringing them the food back into the school district itself. And so thinking about how do we leverage what we have? How do we look around to see where are the opportunities to grow the, the literal food? And then what are the for us, we have a commercial kitchen, so the possibilities for us to utilize that kitchen to give uh, the food an opportunity to find expression in the meals our kids are eating, but then also, of course, to during the pandemic, we were able to share that food in community with drive-through provision of food, but then also, of course, looking at further potentials to grow and expand those partnerships with the school district to um, think about the sourcing locally of their food beyond what they're currently doing. Yeah. You know, that kind of brings me back to a, a comment that Mark made about, um, you know, what's the Tesla of, of food and, you know, early on uh, in, in Tesla's uh, um, 
growth. I, I, I think a lot of people observe that what, while they're making cars, really what they've, they've done is, is um, create a position for distributed energy um, generation and storage and, and particular uses. That became apparent when they invested in the, in the Gigafactory, or the $5 billion Gigafactory in, in um, Nevada. And so when I think about local food production um, and consumption and this sort of connection to farmers markets and, and the kind of work that you're doing, Chandra, and the work that you're doing, Matt, to me, that is kind of the analogy that you know ultimately um, we need to be able to, to produce food for people who live in our communities. And that's a really vital um, function in addition to all the other uh, ecosystem benefits of, of working lands in, in uh, is food production in addition to carbon sequestration and biodiversity and habitats and uh, et cetera. But when we start thinking about that, there's a, and, and you alluded to this a little bit, Mark, there, there's a need to sort of shift our, our belief systems from, you know, we have, these huge um, uh, companies and enterprises that are the sources of food. And yet a lot of people who live in food deserts and, and experience food inequality um, maybe have never seen a peach growing on a tree, right? And, and, and so that sort of shift in belief systems, um, I think is really, uh, really critical. Um, Matt, one of the things we talked about last week was, was the notion that I think a lot of people have become familiar with, you know, during this period um, of the last really 15, 16 months of deepening awareness of, of racism in the United States and trying to listen and learn from others. But this notion of, of seven generations and the belief system that, that's um, uh, inherent in a lot of indigenous practices, can you tell us a little bit um, more about that for people who might not be familiar with it and, and how it relates to food systems? Yeah, and, um, so for us, our whole mission with our organization is focused around the idea that um, to create a better world for future generations. Um, and with that, that's even written in our constitution with our, um, with our tribal government. Um, and so we are actually put, putting that into practice in terms of everything we do today, we're thinking about how it affects seven generations down the line. Um, and this whole idea around seven gen, it isn't just a Suchangu um, um, idea. You know, this um, idea is definitely, this concept is definitely um, in a lot of other indigenous communities as well. Um, and, and I think for us, we are just using, you know, regenerative agriculture as one of the ways we do that. Because um, traditionally we weren't, um, you know, traditional farmers, we were hunter gatherer people. Um, and so for us, I always like to say that we are um, making farming and regenerative farming a, a new uh, tradition for ourselves. Great. Thanks, Matt. Um, so when you talk about seven generations, then the, the thing that occurs to me um, is how can we be good ancestors um, in the imaginations of people far into the future when we think about food systems? Thoughts yeah. On that? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, please. Okay. Um, I, I think for for that kind of going back onto this, I think you know equity and justice, you know, are kind of big words, and um, it requires you know big action. And so I think investing um, at all different levels. And I, I think for for us, what we're trying to do here is um, you know farm, more farm to school programs especially in in, in BIPOC communities um, you know food prescription programs really taking this food as medicine um, concept in, into practice um, and then training programs if we're going to be hoping to you know battle climate change you know we're going to need to be able to change the way we grow our food so having different training programs and um, around that it's going to be something that we really think is going to be something that needs to be focused on in the next you know coming coming years um, so I, I definitely think investment at all levels. Yeah. Lindsay, um, thoughts on how we can be good ancestors? Yeah, you know, I think um, as we can see by all of the incredible people who are my co-panelists or, you know, co-chatters, doing right by your community, doing right by the community and creating access points for the community, I think is really important. Um, you know, and I think doing it right by our ancestors, when you think about what our ancestors have done for us and what they created for us, it's, it's hard to remember sometimes that 
that was future thinking, right? And I think it can be so easy to get caught up in the here and now that we don't see our, see ourselves and we don't see community, including the future. And that's part of the like, you know, overall climate change debate as well, right? Like how, how do we really get people to understand that our future is just important to us now? And I think that's also a key component of doing right by our ancestors is, is that considering the future. Yeah. Mark? The one word that comes to mind is, uh, is narrative. Keep, keep telling the story. Uh, because I, I think that one of, and why this conversation is so important from my standpoint is um, it, some of these conversations happen in, in important pockets and areas, but uh, I think telling this kind of collective narrative over and over again, so that narrative starts to turn into consciousness that turns into collective action. Uh, so that, that to me is, is one of the biggest uh, and most important aspects of this from, from my standpoint. So when we think about collective action, I mean, I'm a pretty firm believer that um, to build a future that we all want to live in, it, it's going to require collective action. There's no individual or organization um, that, that can, can forge a forward path for it, whether it's clean energy or um, food systems or safe drinking water, whatever it is, no, no one can do that um, on their own. Um, I'd love to hear, you know, some of your thoughts about um, with what you know about about malt um, and and um, land trust in general, which have been um, preserving and protecting land, what's the future for for land trust? What role should we play in driving um, a, a future of um, inclusive um, and regenerative food systems? Well, I think uh, one of the things that comes to mind, thing that that is. And you and I have had part of this conversation, but it's it's uh, uh, I'll, I'll, it's a large existential challenge for you, which is how do you deal with the original sin, apologize and rectify it, um, because those things end up advancing the cause, because then then that brings healing and help with it. Now that's also disruptive, if not probably I'll use that term revolutionary to have to lean back and go how we got started was actually kind of wrong. <laughs> and there's all these people benefiting from it. Um, but that acknowledgement and how do you fix it? So how can, how can malt play a transformative role by having that, uh, that self uh, healing consciousness to bring that out to not only Marin County, but I would argue, you know, California and the world because many pockets have have the similar kinds of things where land was taken uh, from indigenous peoples, land was cultivated by people who were working for free or using the proper term, they were slaves. How, how do you, and so how do you continue to lean back and have that reflected in your narrative of where you are today? And then how you can collectively uh, build people to, to help both rectify and build the collective goodwill to um, ensure it doesn't happen again. Yeah, I, I love those comments, Mark. Well, one of the things that occurs to me is that it feels like um, the world is in need of a lot of healing right now. I mean, the, the pandemic, the you know, deepening awareness of racism, um, climate change, and our, our much more um, uh, present awareness of it through all the, the impacts all around the world all the time. Um, I haven't met anyone, you know, uh, there's ranchers and farmers who I've had the privilege of being on their land in Marin County, and I haven't met anyone who, who does not believe that everyone on the planet deserves sufficient and nourishing food. Those people may exist, um, but, but I, I don't think, I think it's a first principle is, is almost everybody um, embraces the idea that we all deserve sufficient and nourishing food and that we want to produce that food in a way that's in harmony with nature and preserves and protects biodiversity. I think the hard part is how do we get from, from here to there, right? Um, especially when there, there's, there are a lot of, of wounds and a, a lot of things that have not been healed. And um, how, how do we move beyond that to, um, to the world that we all wanna live in and the collective action? Other thoughts on that from, we just have a few minutes left here. So love to have, you know, sort of maybe a final round robin of thoughts uh, from the panelists. Uh, um, so maybe we'll start uh, same order Chandra with you. 
Yeah, super quick, two, two thoughts. I mean, one is to have MALT help people have access to the conversation that needs to happen around mm -hmm. this. I think that's incredibly an incredibly important space. Um, and the other closing thought that I would say is, you know, this is about individual empowerment as well. We talked about the stories. It's also the stories that we tell ourselves, and it's about our relationship to our own bodies. And in many cases, those are internalized oppressions that we carry. And so really being willing to say the connection of earth to food, to body, to future, and then the question of living our ancestors um, and, and creating that inheritance is incredibly important. So the willingness to recognize that sometimes it's also the stories we tell ourselves and the connections that we have to our own bodies. And that brings in a lot of layers of what justice means and difficult conversations for us as individuals too. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that, Chandra. And, and you know, that was the intention in creating this series and is the intention of the series of our common ground is to create a space to have some of these conversations and, and learn together um, and, and, and ensure that we're hearing a, a diverse uh, set of voices as we imagine uh, the future state. Um, Matt, um, your thoughts. Yeah, I, I would like to just say that um, I, I think continuing to support and include um, BIPOC voices is, is something that's really important, um, especially for Indigenous people who you don't really get a, you know, a chair at the table um, in these types of conversations. And so I um, would just like to say continue to support them because um, I think Indigenous people have and always will be fighting for a um, future that is, um, you know, safe, you know, whether that's with land, food, energy, or air, um, water. Um, and, and, I, and I just think that, um, you know, by including me today, I, I really appreciate that. Um, and so I think um, just having, you know, including more of these voices in, in these spaces. Yeah, well, I wanna say we appreciate you making time to be here and share your knowledge and, and wisdom with us. And I, I think, you know, one, one of my beliefs about collective action is that we can all learn from each other. Um, and, and that is part of um, the path forward. Uh, Lindsay. Yeah, you know, we've talked a lot about public policy during this conversation. And, you know, when we look at some of the policy debates happening right now, there's areas where we can step in for collective action and make a difference and say, hey, this needs to be done. For example, debt relief for farmers of color. That is a debate that is happening right now that needs support. Those farmers need support in saying, hey, land and money has been taken away from us consistently over since the beginning of this country, since we were considered humans in this country. And we need relief from that. And you know that's being fought against. That's a conversation that we need to be jumping into. And we talk about cow fresh dollars and public spending on food access, talking about how these are things that actually stimulate our economy. The long held narrative is that they drain our economy. And we know from programs like Chandra, Chandra is working on, like programs that are happening here with the LA Food Policy Council near, near me, that that's not the case. They stimulate the economy. So we, these are the conversations that we can jump into now with collective action that organizations like MALT can make a difference by taking a stand in. Thank you, Lindsay. Mark. Uh, again, grateful thing for, uh, for the opportunity. Uh, I must say plus three to everything that was said. And I would just add in terms of collective action, it always needs leadership. So uh, when you're ready to run for uh, governor of California, uh, I'm all in and, you, and <laughs> you're gonna transform the place. Let's go. <laughs> Yeah, um, I don't know if I'm going to be running for governor, but I do have an ongoing joke with Lindsay that uh, she, she needs to run for president someday and do it before I'm too old to, to help with the campaign. Um, I, I really uh, appreciate all of you joining us uh, for this um, episode of Our Common Ground, which will be rebroadcast on KWMR and, and on Marine Agricultural Land Trust uh, website. We, we hope that you'll join us for our, our next, se next session, apologies, our next session on December 1st at four o'clock. And we'll be looking at innovations and in land access, which is part of uh, the food uh, justice conversation. How do people get access to land to produce their own food? Um, and what are some of the innovations out there to uh, help provide access to people who might not have had it, uh, to new farmers and ranchers, and especially uh, to people of color. So thank you all for joining us again. Uh, have a great afternoon um, and bye-bye. <laughs>